Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this uh, Thursday IFT webinar. Uh, today we are very happy to have with us uh, Sebastián Céspedes from the IFT. Uh, he has been with us for a few months now, but uh, he's technically a, a newcomer because he came roughly at the same time as the, yeah, as the virus. So uh, uh, he came on time for the confinement. And uh, so I, I, I would like to welcome you officially, uh, taking this opportunity to welcome you officially to the AFT. So uh, he's going to tell us about his later, uh, latest work on uh, time evolution of cosmological correlation functions. So thank you very much and go ahead. Okay, so thank you Pepe for the introduction and uh, thank you everyone for listening to me. So I'm gonna talk about some recent work uh, that we put on the archive in collaboration with and Davis and Scott Melville from Cambridge. Okay, so uh, so the CMB is one of the is a, uh, one of the most important uh, ex experimental verifications from the early universe that we have, and so far the last decade we got a lot of information from them, from it. So in particular, uh, the main observable in cosmology and where, where we can extract information is by analyzing the correlation functions and the statistics of the CMB are encoded in this. So for, uh, for this talk, we're gonna assume that these correlation functions are produced during inflation and then are translated into uh, cosmological observables such as the cosmic microwave background, but also to large scale structure. So there are some uh, well-known facts about these uh, correlation functions when, come, when they come from inflation. So in particular, they are probably uh, quantum fluctuations from a scalar field, which uh, is parameterized by a field called usually theta. And this field uh, freezes after it leaves the horizon, which implies that it's very easy to, uh, so it's very easily uh, translated into observables. Uh, furthermore, given this uh, scalar fields is very constrained by the symmetries of the scalar field and not also the symmetries of the space time. And in particular, very important is that the two point function is almost scale invariant and the higher order correlation functions are very constrained, but also they uh, obey uh, co consistency conditions due to the symmetry at any order. So, a simplified model of, of inflation or the first approximation we can think of is uh, by looking at the sitter. So we're gonna uh, uh, discuss mostly the sitter space times in the Poincaré patch, which is the one that I'm showing here, where I have that uh, the metric is conformally is, uh, is related to by this conformal factor to Minkowski and where time is called eta that runs from minus infinity in the past to zero in the future. So this space time has a large set of symmetries and in particular, apart from Lorentz invariance, it has dilatations and boost symmetry. This fact is very important because when we uh, take the conformal time going to zero, then the isometries become conformal invariant. And then we can use the tools of, of uh, conformal invariance to constrain more the correlation functions. So this is done usually by uh, solving the set of world identities related to a symmetry. And it, it has uh, driven a lot of attention from the past, I say five years, although there's uh, work from before. And it goes with the name of cosmological bootstrap program or com cosmological collider physics. So the main idea is to is that uh, by taking the so okay so usually when we analyze the, the scalar field fluctuations we do a perturb, a perturbative analysis we take the a field we quantize it then we take the vacuum in the past and then we go to, we propagate it to the future and then analyze what, what we see there so then the, this economical uh, bootstrap program what it does is takes uh, the conformal invariance and the word identities, and that will lead to a, that will lead to a set of differential equations uh, that one can solve. And then, by looking at the solutions, and also in particular by uh, making some assumptions about the structure of the solutions, we can derive the results that are, are related to the ones that one have obtained by perturbation theory in inflation. 
So for, for example, what I'm putting here is the is a three-point function and the effect of a massive scalar field. So where P of zeta is a two-point function for the scalar field, and and in, in a particular interesting limit is where one takes one of the modes to be very long. So that implies that there are an observable that will depend on the mass of the of the uh, extra field when and when the and when the mass is larger than some uh, value, there will be oscillations. Also, by using these conformal techniques, one can uh, do new things, which uh, in particular, very interestingly, is, for example, to include particles with arbitrary spin. So this is, even though we have a, a lot of observations about the two-point function, we haven't get anything yet from the three-point function. And because we, we can't get uh, things that I showed you before, where there is uh, information about, sorry? Okay. When there is information about new particles, uh, it will be important to, because in, for future surveys, there might be the possibility that we can actually observe them. So it's very important to understand their origin and what are their signatures. So, okay. Now I'm gonna discuss a little bit about, uh, because we have this uh, boundary that one gets at eta going to zero, and then one might, and there's a conformal invariance there. So one can nearly think, okay, what about holography there? So, so far, I mean, that has driven some attention, especially 20 years ago, and uh, there, there are some proposals, but none of them really work that well. And, uh, uh, and there are also non known uh, conformal field theory that we live in this uh, sort of boundary for, for the sitter that makes sense for cosmology yet. But still, there are some ideas from there that one can uh, take more seriously and, and might be useful as a guide to understand more about the, the correlation functions. So now I'm gonna explain a little bit what ideas are I'm gonna be more interested in. So the main analogy that one does if we write this uh, anti sitter metric, uh, and we take the CFT, this, then this radial direction will be holographically emerging when I add some deformation to a CFT. And people think, and there's some maybe evidence that, some, that what happens in the sitter is that is the time that, is, that emerges um, holographically. And that implies that most of the observables are, are time independent when one uh, in, in some particular limits and this is one of the one of the of the guiding principles. Um, there is also some analogies that one can take from. So uh, this is more a computational tool. So if I compute something in anti sitter and with a given CFT, which probably is sometimes easier, then I can do a double width rotation when I rotate uh, time and also I rotate the the, the radius of the space time, which in this case will be the, the Hubble parameter for, for the S. Then I get some results that are very similar. And then some people will think that the, there is some wave function in the sitter, which is related to a hotter hawking wave function, which might be related to a partition function for a given CFT. So this result has been established uh, mostly perturbatively, and because as I told, just now, there is no known CFT. So now I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna focus in this talk mostly in the structure of this wave function and, and how useful they can be to to study the time evolution of the correlation functions. So just uh, some uh, generalities about the wave function. So I'm gonna th think of a weakly coupled theory where I expand my the, this wave function psi in terms of uh, this field profile psi but psi bar, sorry, and then some uh, wave function coefficients which go with the capital O. So by, uh, uh, so then I can relate these correlation functions from the wave function coefficients to correlation functions from the wave function coefficients to correlation functions for the scalar fields as it is written there. So one example, so for example, if I want to compute the two point function, um, I, I, I write down the, the, the action which is consistent with the symmetries of, of the sitter or anti-sitter and I, I do the double analytic continuation. 
And I get that the, the second coefficient is given by that term there. So two things to notice here is the first one is that uh, this expression actually diverges when I take the limit eta going to zero. And also that it looks to be not local. So which is fine because that's how we can observe collation functions in the sky. So, and then if I take the limit when the, the mass is going to zero, that means that this parameter nu goes to three divided by two. Uh, and then I square the wave function, I get uh, that the correlation function is equal to h squared divided by q, k cubed, which is the unknown result uh, for people familiar with scalar fields in inflation. So good. So then the question is how do I, I compute what is inside the, the action? So there are two ways, uh, the most common ways to do path integral and perturbation theory. And, and then I draw propagators, bulk to boundary propagators and uh, bulk to bulk propagators. So I can compute that perturbatively, but one can also, uh, uh, by the, in, in the same way, solve the Schrodinger equation that just come by, by imposing uh, this answer for the wave function. So if I do that, that, that will lead to a Hamiltonian co-equation, which is first order, but then I, I can also uh, see some things about the time evolution. So, okay. So now to what I'm gonna focus mostly during this talk. So, so far, most of the discussion has been done at eta going to zero because there is this nice conformal limit when I can do things without uh, forgetting about any model. But then there, there are pressing questions like what's what's the time evolution of the wave function? Also, one of the, the main uh, difficulties with the this the Sitter CFT con, uh, conjecture is that for massive fields, it might be the case that the CFT is non-unitary. But that doesn't make sense because we what what would it mean to have a, a non-unitary? I mean, so that that might draw some uh, to some mistakes to think that the Hamiltonian is non-unitary, which is not right. So then the, the question that follows from there is what are the consequences from unitarity on the on the on the time evolution of this commonality correlation function? Also, uh, this is something that I'm gonna uh, Sebastian. Uh, sorry, sorry, but it, it's kind of clear that the, uh, the unitarity of time evolution uh, in uh, inside the sitter or whatever uh, cosmological space time you consider doesn't have anything to do with unitarity on uh, on the space like uh, surface where the function is defined because that one is completely Euclidean itself and that uh, if it were to be unitary that uh, the equivalent of unitary would mean that uh, it will uh, um, uh, uh, it will have the property of a reflection positivity but uh, that uh, will be a time which uh, is uh, on the boundary. Here we are talking about the time evolution you, you carry about uh, is inside the bulk. So the two things are totally unrelated. So it's clear that uh, you, uh, you, you can have a completely fine unitarity, uh, unitary evolution in, in the bulk and having something which is completely not, uh, not unitary at the boundary. Yeah, I agree. Not... But I would like to know what are the consequences of unitarity in the bulk for the boundary? for instance. So then I need to find a proper way of defining what unitarity means for the Y function. Right. But yeah, I agree with, with that comment. Um, so okay, so, and then we're gonna analyze what are the consequences of this and also uh, what can we say about the, some more analytical properties of the Y function coefficients. So, okay. So now I'm going to explain some bit what one does when we solve the, the Schrodinger equation. So we're going to define some state uh, living, uh, living on a given time slice. And then its time evolution will just be given, as I said before, by the Schrodinger equation. We're going to consider for simplicity only isotropic states. And when we do this, this equation uh, reduces to the hamilton jacobi equation. So this is a cartoon of, of what we have in mind. So we take some state psi. I'm going to call the wave function coefficients at finite time as c. And I'm going to call the coefficients at, uh, at time going to zero as o in energy with conformal field theories. And then I'm going to assume that I can pick a 
uh, a vacuum. So the usual choice that we do in cosmology is to pick the bunch Davis vacuum, uh, which uh, corresponds to having uh, in going web waves, in going wavelengths. When we take the limit of uh, eta going to minus infinity. And that goes because in the sitter, if we take that limit, then the uh, the horizon is very far, and most of the modes looks as if they were in flat space time. So this goes in energy to uh, common quantum field theory. Okay, so once I do that, I can so for example take the first coefficient. So I'm going to consider first a, a Gaussian state C two, and then. Uh, if I, I, I solve the Hamiltonian equation, I can define a creation and relation operator as is written there, where there, apart from this C, there is this related parameter FK, which is the, the mode function, which I get it by imposing that the, that the coefficient is canonically normalized. And now there is one of the implications, one of the main difference when we have this uh, time dependent background is that the the image of this C parameter uh, depends on the time evolution of the, the parameter F. So in the case that we were having flat space time, that will be zero. Sorry, can I ask? Uh, mm -hmm. So you're assuming here that you have a Gaussian state. So you are thinking of some free field in some time dependent background? Yes. OK. Because the idea is I want to make perturbation theory, so I'm going to start with this. OK. OK. So then I can consider an interactive Hamiltonian. And for uh, it will it's very practical to define uh, the interactive coefficients as are written there. So I have these C coefficients, and I multiply them by the, the mode functions or the conjugate of the mode functions. So if I do that, then I will get that uh, equation that is from there that is uh, very easy to interpret. So for example, uh, if we have the, so given some coefficient that is in this, in the, in the first term, its time evolution will be given by terms that come from exchanges of particles, terms that come from loops, or terms that will come from vertices. So now I'm not going to focus on, I'm going to only focus on, on three level interactions that will come from exchanges and vertices. I refer discussion on loops for these recent papers. So, okay, now given that, we can actually say a little bit about unitarity. So, first, note that if I write the, the, the wave function entirely, then the the square of it is uh, equal to the is related to the image of this gamma functional. So then, if I plug that back into the Hamiltonian equation, and I, I impose uh, that the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, I found this relation from there, which only says that the uh, loops are constrained by by the three-level exchanges. Now, if we want to say a little bit more, then it becomes very practical to define the following quantity, which is the, this discontinuity from there, which I take one of the coefficient and any order, and then I subtract their, the coefficient uh, where first I take the conjugate, but also I analytically continue the momenta. So the momenta, so this hat, which, which is inside the momenta is is the transformation such that I, I analytically continue, sorry, I conjugate the, the mode function. So if I post that over the, if I write that into the wave function coefficients, then I find, I'll find an infinite set of, of quantities that I will call beta. So I'm putting here beta for the three point function, but also beta for the four point function in the case that I have an exchange of uh, two, three uh, coefficients. So then very interestingly, if I put, impose the uh, time derivative of beta and then I use the Hamiltonian equations and then I impose that the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, then I find that these uh, coefficients beta are equal to zero. 
And so by doing so, I derive uh, some result result, which is the uh, cosmological optical theorem, which was derived by the group of Enrico Payer. So the, I'm, I'm just plotting here what the diagrams lo will look like for the four point function. So basically, I have this uh, correlation, four point correlation, four point correlation function that goes uh, that has this four momenta, and then there is a chain momenta s. So the subtraction of this minus this uh, continuation in momenta will give me um, two pr products of a uh, three point function. And it sort of goes in analogy with the optical theorem in flat space and time where I take the, the image of the S matrix and then I get result uh, by relating uh, higher order correlation functions to lower order and point correlation functions. So these results, I'm just now showing it in a very simple setup where I only have scalar fields, but uh, in, in this work, it was shown that it holds for more complicated uh, interactions such as interaction with gravitons. Um, sorry, Sebastian. Um, in this picture that you've shown, uh, this holds for the actual correlation, uh, correlation function, not for the coefficient of, of the wave function. Yeah, holds for the correlation function. And do you have, uh, or maybe in the next slides, how it translates in terms of coefficients of the wave function? So in coefficient of the wave function, it, tra it translates as a, in the previous slide. Right. Okay. So you have this C case. This will be the wave function coefficient. But then you have to sum over this F functions over this uh, mode function. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Could I derive this just by doing Kutkowski rules on the bulk uh, for the Feynman expression for the correlator? But Kutkowski rules are not related to loops. Yeah, but you said something about loops and tree uh, also. No, but this is, I mean, I'm not, I'm neglecting all loops. This is only for tree level uh, diagrams. Uh -huh. Well, you, you can apply even in flat space Katkowski rules to, uh, to trees, just uh, you get some delta functions and that's what gives you the factorization theorem. So, I mean, Katkowski roots, uh, it's a generic name that you can- Yeah, yeah, use. okay. So the point is, um, if the derivation you did, uh, looks different because you are using the wave function formalism. But if you used uh, all the time the correlation functions and you expressed some perturbative technique to compute them using Feynman diagrams in the sitter space, mm -hmm. would it look more like a, like a standard uh, unitarity argument of quantum field theory? Well, that's what the this paper by that I'm referring did. So they use uh, Feynman diagrams to derive it. They weren't using the solving the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, so by, I mean, so by assuming unitarity, you will automatically fall into that. But yeah, so, so they're, they're equivalent. Okay. So, Okay, so now, uh, so far I have only discussed about the time evolution of the this wave version coefficient, but I haven't said anything about the how the isometries can constrain the the coefficients. So, just to remind, uh, so I, I was considering the seat. So, so sorry, the discussion previously was only was valid. Sorry, was valid for any space time that was where this where you have this the omega factor. Now I'm gonna uh, go to to the sitter. So I'm gonna simplify a little bit what I'm doing. And so one of the main things we get is that uh, we can use the we can use the isometries of the sitter. And so um, we can build the charges associated to the isometries, which are written there. One point to notice is that. Uh, this will only make sense if I apply the charges to the equal time correlators. And then, uh, so if I want to write time derivatives of the scalar field, then in order to apply to equal time correlators, I need it's better to consider momentum insertions rather than time derivatives of, of this scalar field phi. So, if I do that, and then I, I, I would like, because I, I've been discussing the time evolution of the coefficients, so it's better to write them as a version for the coefficient. 
So I can do that and I can try to find what are the constraints over them. So one thing is that um, to notice that this Hamiltonian is separated from this, sorry, the interactive Hamiltonian is separated from this. So there are a lot of cases where the interactive Hamiltonian decays faster uh, and then it, it doesn't reach a boundary. So we have some kind of universality properties there. So uh, in what goes, I'm gonna explain why this might be useful. Now, some example of how this is useful. So if I take the, uh, the two point function for uh, the sitter space time and I solve it, then what I find is uh, that expression from there where this H2 and H2 are Henkel functions. So this in the um, limit where alpha uh, in is equal to zero produces to the, sorry, yeah, alpha i e is equal to i, or it reduces to the bunch Davis initial condition. But I want to keep things as simple as possible. And so I'm gonna, ask, so one can ask, okay, so if I have that, uh, what are the constraints over this alpha k coefficient? So, and this coefficient comes because I'm, I'm solving a first order differential equation, or I'm doing one integral over time. So then it's natural that one have one initial condition to put. And then if we apply isometry, the isometries, which in the case of the two-point function, uh, the ones that are not trivial are the dilatations, I can find that alpha k is uh, conformally invariant. And so this result is uh, actually equivalent to deriving, the, the, deriving that there is an infinite family of, of vacua for a sitter, which are consistent with the isometries, which goes as the name with alpha vacua. But very interestingly, I can have, I can put, in, so because I'm doing integrals, I can put initial conditions for any uh, correlation functions. And then for any of them, I can ask what are the conditions that are obeyed due to the isometries. So um, for example, uh, if I take the limit eta going to zero and these uh, isometries reduce to the, to our identities for the coefficients, and they are equivalent to, uh, to what people have been doing using CFDs. So this is, comes from actually what people do when they do the, the conformal bootstrap and this is the equivalent version in, in this frame, so, sorry, in this setup. So if I define this alpha M parameter, where, which I'm, where I'm taking all the time independent of the coefficient, then I can find these word identities and I can solve them. And by solving them, I can find what are the possible uh, uh, shapes that the, this coefficient can have due to the symmetries. So one needs to go a little bit with care about this because there are some cases where the word identities are, are not uh, respected, namely. And this is because so in some cases, for example, if I have three space special dimensions, then the coefficient goes at one divided by three minus t minus some log. And okay, so for d different from three, this there is no problem, this is invariant under dilatation, but for uh, d equal to three, then one needs to add a term to the, uh, there is an anonymous contribution to the word entity that one needs to take care of. And this will be important when we analyze some examples in the next slides. Okay, now one question will be, okay, so because I, I can solve the coefficients alpha just by using conformal symmetry, then is there any uh, expansion that makes sense at small time that can take some coefficient at some given time alpha that I'm just solving it without looking at the action and then propagate it back in time? Um, so and how is this related to the different sets of initial conditions that so Another way of seeing this is, okay, before I was just providing initial conditions in the past, such as I'm assuming the vacuum Miss Bunch Davis, but can I do something similar just by looking at the future of the space time where I, I know that I can solve things and then trace, trace back in the past? So the first attempt, the first attempt to do this is to solve in the so-called super horizon limit when I'm assuming that the conformal time is very small. Sorry, can I ask? Uh, yes. 
Uh, are you saying that the alpha parameters have something to do with the alpha parameters of the alpha vacua? No, because they won't necessarily uh, define the vacua. It's some kind of, so it, so you have, for example, alpha three or alpha four in, is related to having some initial excited state. But it's not, uh, you're not saying that you are doing a different vacuum choice, uh, different from Bunch Davis. Are you still in Bunch Davis or not? And not necessarily. So, okay, I'm going to assume that, okay, alpha two, I'm going to- You have a, a finite energy excitation over a Bunch Davis. That's one thing. But an alpha vacuum is something which is kind of different from Bunch Davis at all momenta. Yes. Mm -hmm. and at, all, uh, at all energies, right? Mm -hmm. So in, okay, which, so in which situation we are here? No, so for this expansion, I'm going to assume that I, I will le leave alpha free. So I can be in, in alpha vacuum, alpha two free, but scale independent. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to see what are the, uh, uh, so because, okay, so for cosmology, the, the main thing that happens when you have non bunch Davis vacuum is that there are for the singularities in higher order correlation functions. That means that if you take, for example, k1 plus k2 minus k3, uh, so there will be some functions that will depend on, on those sort of relations, they will diverge. So by taking the alpha vacuum, uh, sorry, by taking bunch David, you removed all of them. So then I, I want to see how will, did, uh, how will that appear in this, uh, in this setup, but also is is the question okay? So if I if I have some in, some, I mean I think one can ask the question okay. So if I have the boundary at it are going to zero, uh, what that what will imply to have bunch Davis in the past, and where that that comes from? So okay, so. Uh, one can uh, write the, the mod functions at small eta. So this is a relation that is not always valid as some n, which is a normalization that we can fix by imposing uh, canonical commutation relations. And some function f, which will be analytic in k and eta. So it goes as, as that sum that is over there. And if I resum that f, um, then I can find that, uh, so if I resum this series of k and eta, then I find that this is related to a Bessel function. So this is totally, uh, this, is a, this f is totally analytic, but if I, but then by picking the bunch Davis, I will introduce non analyticity on the, on the function f and you know, on all the observables. So I can do this at higher order uh, wave function coefficients. Oh, sorry. So then, uh, okay. So because this, I can solve the hamilton jacobi equations just by doing these expansions as at small liter. And then I can add some alpha k coefficient that will depend on the initial conditions. Then I can expand this a, this, sorry, this ck initial in terms of some coefficients alpha k and then some function i, which is also analytical in momentum and time. And then I can do a resummation or to see what there is the effect over this CK. So if I do this resummation uh, diagrammatically, I can show that I have, have the two point function. This is equivalent to adding uh, error, uh, an infinite number of insertion of this F plus and F new, which are analytic functions. And if I resume them, then I will sort of shift in the initial coefficients, which goes in analogy of adding an M square phi square term to, to the propagator that shifts the propagator. So I can do something similar for higher than coefficients. And so this will be a bit more useful for the future. So for the future of the talk, so I can expand, I can, I can define this function f, so which is will be, I will do the same expansion for uh, for all the momenta. And then I can def make an expansion over alpha k. So the first one, it depends on the initial conditions given at the boundary, then I, I have the solution that comes from the hamilton jacobi equation, and then when I analyze at each order how picking some initial conditions will change the, the coefficients. 
So with this in mind, I'm going to define some transfer functions that will take me. So this i curly i, what will do will be to take in some initial some some initial conditions at the boundary and propagate it back to the past. So if I do that, uh, I can show that uh, these are also analytic in momenta and are written there. Sorry. So okay. So then one can uh, do a couple of things with them that are interesting. So so far I'm just been talking about uh, so source of analysis to come from the initial conditions by picking Bunch Davis, but also they can uh, come if we do a resumation of this series I. So one can write an integral expression that is valid for arbitrary time uh, by performing an integral over these uh, sums over these functions f. And then uh, ask, okay, so this sum is uh, not very practical, but because in most of the cases, we don't know how to make this integral. But uh, we can take the limit uh, of the conformal time going to minus infinity. And then for example, in the four point function, if I first make the assumption that K4 is the largest momenta, uh, and I do the integral from there up to some arbitrary time, what it happens is that I find that there is a, an exponential that will be over k1, k2, k3, k4, some of them will appear. So okay, first, um, if I, in general, this will imply that there are kt poles where kt is uh, just the sum of the four momenta, but then there are other uh, folded, folded terms, which by folded I'm just meaning that one of the terms is minus. I'll actually remove when I, I pick bunch Davis. So then I can see that even if I, I so all these sorts of, of uh, poles that were appearing that, and then one can see when we compute the correlation functions actually appear when I take the limit uh, beyond the horizon. Okay, now I'm gonna discuss a bit about divergences to make this more consistent. So if we take back and we look at the, um, at the transfer functions, then we can see that actually for when the, the sum of these conformal dimensions is equal to D, then there will be some divergence. And in general, when the sum is equal to some uh, two times an integer, an integer number, then there will be also divergences. So now it comes uh, very clear what I was looking at the, it will be more clear what I was taking this alpha coefficient and what are they useful. So then I'm gonna uh, draw an analogy with what people do in, in conformal field theory momentum space. And I'm gonna just pick two kinds of divergences that appear also there. So first there are uh, ultra local divergences where the terms are poorly analytical momenta, which is the one that you can see from here. But also there will be semi-local divergences that I can also discuss uh, within this framework when one of the momenta is non-analytic. Okay, so given that I have the boundary coefficients and then I have some divergences, to remove ultra local uh, the divergence, I can do what can I do is to reshift one of the coefficients by some uh, polynomial where delta NL is related to the degree of the divergence. So it's related to the masses of the fields uh, where the divergence is. Now, if I want to sorry, remove, sorry. yes. Uh, are we sure we are, we want to remove the divergences? Uh, maybe they are physical for particle production or something. So, okay, so no, because one of the questions is, so we'll see this more clear when we are in, and when we take examples. So if I take a conformally coupled field or a massless field, and then I compute the, so I mean the the the, 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 the this normalization scale will be also appearing there. So it's not that it's gonna go away. I mean that if you can, as you say, the divergences with uh, some behavior in diagrams, maybe it's more intuitive what to do with them. But um, what is the physical interpretation of these different types of divergences? No, so the interpretation of divergences here is that, okay, so because these are three level divergences. At three so level, yeah. These are three level, yes. So they are on shell things? Yes. 
Well, um, their, their their physical production of particles or something like that. So what happens is that if you take a, so when I approach the boundary, it, it will be something like an image that's behind the boundary. So if I, I take the particle, the limit where the, the this particle goes to it equal to zero, then the image the particle in the image they will collapse. So I have this divergence where x minus uh, i, for example, in, in in position space, go to zero. Mm -hmm. But so. What I want to do is to, okay, so because the, these divergence will appear when I solve the, the word identities in momentum space. So for some cases. So if I want to actually match what I have in Bunch Davis to what happens in the boundary, then I need to take care of what were the, how do I match with the divergence? Or how, then how do I relate with, with what's happening in the boundary? Okay, so then I have these also semi-local divergences where I will have to retrieve all the coefficients for up to some more, for some order and then higher, which is also equivalent to just shifting the, the scalar field. Okay, so this is what I was referring recently. So if I provide the, because that was, okay, given the coefficients in the future. Nice, if I get the coefficients in the past, I have to be very careful about how we how do we take the limit uh, eta going to zero. So, okay, I'm gonna give some time dependence to the operators, and then I'm gonna do something called boundary operator expansion when I, this operator will be a sum over uh, some other there, some will be related to the coefficients that live in the boundary. So for example, if I take the phi and the momentum operator, then their boundary operator expansion is just the mix, this coefficient given by phi hat and pi hat that live in the boundary. So if I redefine everything like that, and then I want to write the, the correlation function for the Scalar field uh, hat phi. Then I can make this uh, wave function, sorry, this co co coefficient very. Uh, I can remember, I make it very. I can make it fine very easily just by uh, taking some assumptions of this uh, function c. So I can do this for interacting theories as well, and because a bit more complicated. Although for ultra local divergences, I will just only uh, shift the, 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 the operator by some coefficient. And for the semi local divergence, what I will do is to add a tower of, of operators for each coefficient in order to have a finite answer. Okay. So to summarize, uh, okay, so source analysis can come from the initial conditions if we, for example, pick Van Davis, uh, sorry, Van, Van Davis. Um, we can have that, so we can have a, a coefficients or initial condition that come either from picking a vacuum, but also by picking some excited state. And also these coefficients can diverge at a conformal time going to zero uh, so if we want to get a finite answer, then we need to take care of them. Okay, so now I'm gonna, uh, in, in the, for the end of my talk, I'm gonna explain some import, some ex examples to give more intuition about what I was doing. So the first one is the conformally coupled field, uh, where I take that the mass of the field is equal to two times the, the Hubble rate. And this is uh, the easiest situation for the sitter because the, the mode function is as if it were in flat space time. It's just an exponential. So I just have uh, products of exponential. So the first thing is to solve for the free theory. And if, I, if you look at the coefficient from there, I, I'll I'm, I'm leaving for now because I want to analyze what are the isometries over the, the coefficient alpha. I'm leaving it as if it were for, for any, sorry, this alpha parameter is free. Um, 
Okay, sorry. And then, uh, as I explained before, uh, if I want bunch Davis, I just can set alpha equal to zero. But also, I can have other things which are consistent with isometries. Now, one can solve the quartic coefficient, uh, which is much simpler. So then I have another coefficient alpha in that, that depends on four momenta. So I want to see what are the consequences of the isometries for there, for that. And so it, usually if you compute bunch Davis, you set that to zero. But also there are other answers which are consistent with the isometries. So uh, either alpha in is equal to one divided by kt pole by the sorry by kt. So that will be a redshifted of the of the coupling, or it just can keep it equal to zero. And that, and then I put a relation about how this is related to giving some coefficient at the boundary. What I can also do is to resume the transfer function in some particular cases. And then, uh, so this was a, uh, so the, this i were, uh, were an integral expression, but because I just have exponential, I can do the exponential. And if you see this, you have this s functions, which are minus or plus one. And then you want to assume that the theory is, is I mean, I assume that I, I don't assume anything about the uh, these coefficients provided at the time, uh, eta going to infinity. And I left them free. I can see that there are uh, all kinds of possibilities. But importantly, if I, this will uh, produce singularity. So if I want to remove them and I pick bunch Davis, then I will only have the one divided by KT pole, which is well behaved. Okay, now if you took the cubic, uh, cubic interaction, sorry, and uh, pick some back and makes uh, make solve the differential equation and uh, write it for arbitrary time, I will find that expression from there where, where this EI is exponential integral. So this exponential integral uh, diverges near the boundary. So, and, and I see this because if I can expand the, uh, exp the ex exponential integral and I see it will depend of a log of kT eta. So uh, what one can do is to, okay, so if you want to regularize this function, uh, one way, for example, is by um, assuming that, uh, so I, I can use uh, dim rec and, um, sorry. Um, Okay, I can assume the break, and then I can find that there is a single pole in this delta, which is uh, the the small parameter where I'm expanding the dimensions, and I can remove it just by shifting the wave the the wave function coefficient alpha, as I was saying for a ultra local divergence. Right, I can do also uh, the resumation for the transfer function in the case that I want to start from the answer from the from solving the word identities in the conformal limit and then take it back to the past. I can also do a summation and I get the result that matches what we know from um, what we know from solving the we, by using the bunch Davis and propagating from the past. So, sorry. And then I can see that if I want to remove the divergences, meaning that I want to relate the parameter in the past to the parameter in the future, then I have this dependence on mu. And in order to make that very small, then I have to pick a, a, a scale mu, but that will be imprinted into, into the final answer. Okay, so for now, for a massless scalar field, uh, which is most rela more related to cosmology, um, I can solve the first coefficient. Now I'm gonna assume bunch Davis because I, I'm gonna be interested in, in other things. Um, so that implies that uh, by picking that coefficient for the for the two point function, and I'm gonna and then I want to solve higher order correlation function. So one that it, it gives a bit of troubles is the uh, three point function. So first I pick it and I solve the Hamilton-Jacob equations. So I get that answer from there. 
The answer from there also contains an exponential integral, so it diverges at eta going to zero. To regularize it, um, I have to, I can use the reg. And then it happens that this, there is still a single pole, but you can see that the single pole is uh, also multiplied by the momenta cube. So that's one of the, that's what I was meaning by a semi-local divergence. So I can still remove the divergence by just redefining the, the wave function coefficients. But by doing that, I will also be uh, normalizing all the, so and by doing that or by um, shifting the field, which will do the same trick, then I will be normalizing all higher order uh, coefficients. Okay. So one uh, last thing is that we can uh, apply all of this to inflation, which is a bit, I mean, I mean we cannot say much yet because uh, it's a bit trickier, just because the case that the background breaks the isometries. So all the information that we had about that was broken, but we can still do, or we made some progress on it. So uh, I think the most natural way of thinking about or applying this, um, this uh, procedure to inflation is by using the effective field theory of inflation. So here, what one does is to say, okay, so this uh, inflation will be an epoch where the sitter breaks. So there will be a, a broken time translation. Because of this, there will be a Goldstone boson and I'm going to write the action for this Goldstone boson, which is uh, most, which is consistent with all the symmetries of the problem. Also, because of there is chip symmetry that makes uh, that there needs to respect to have a scale invariant power spectrum, there will be a nonlinear realized symmetries that can uh, add some simplicity to the EFT of inflation. So. Uh, this is a, okay, so I was considering the limit where uh, the sitter metric was interacting so, uh, with the scalar field or uh, the gravity was fixed. So the EFT of inflation in general as, uh, starts with more than that. So in that case, I will have the Hamiltonian is equal to zero, but uh, I can uh, make some approximations and it's one that is also do by the people that usually do the effective this business of the EFT of inflation is take something that they call the couple limit, which is up to some energies. Then uh, I can consider the theory for the uh, scalar fluctuations as if it, the metric were frozen. So if I do that, then uh, I can write the, the Hamiltonian of the action and then I can solve for it. So one very interesting thing is that given that there is a, a chip symmetry, then one can, what all the discussion I was doing for the, um, um, for the divergences disappear and, and the answers, answers are finite. And that's uh, important because one can think, okay, so what if I, so why all these observables are finite? So uh, this sort of gives some explanation of what that happens. Okay, just to conclude. So we have studied or uh, some attempts to study the, the evolution of the cosmological correlator functions at finite time. We have uh, give some ideas of what are the implications of unitarity. We have analyzed what are the, where analytics can come and where, where are the, the non-analytical terms appearing. And we have discussed the symmetries. So this leads to a, a lot of open questions. So um, I think there will be more implications of unitarity that need to be uh, investigated in the future. So we're talking before about Qtin rules. I think that that's one of the important things about also causality. I know that uh, Paolo has a recent paper about that. And also I was motivated the wave function by holography, but I haven't said anything about holography. So there might be some implications from there that can be uh, analyzed more thoroughly. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sebastian, for this uh, nice uh, discussion. So are there any questions for Sebastian? Yeah, um, I have one. Okay. And so my question will be, um, well, uh, 
how much of what you said can be used even approximately for the case of multi-feed inflation where you've got consistency relations that are broken or softly broken? Can we use any of this machinery? Because you know, that would be very nice. Yeah, I think so. So I think it's in particular, the this optical theorem, I, I think it will hold if you put uh, more fields there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also th that relation uh, didn't follow from the symmetry. So I mean, it, it follows also from when you do the FT of inflation. So you can uh, add extra fields and and try to see what are the allowed interactions, for example, for when for these extra fields. And okay, so even if I break this consistency relation, you can still get something out of the. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. More questions? Uh, I have one. Can you give an interpretation of the these divergences you were discussing in position space? For example, the local one, which is a polynomial in K, is like a contact term in position space, right? Mm -hmm. But the semi-local ones, what what? What kind of process in real space in the sitter or approximately the sitter space do they correspond to? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I have to say that I, I don't know now. Because for example, if I have, uh, I don't know, if I have massless particles in the theory yes. and I, I have two points or any two points in a correlation function that get into the light, a relative light cone of each other, the fact that I can exchange an on-shell massless particle there gives me a enhancement of the of the correlation function, right? which is totally physical. It's not something I should subtract or anything like that. I just have a real particle that is produced and can hit uh, these two operators. Uh, is there something similar here where uh, some of the singularities should be kept because they are physical or should I try to remove them always uh, in some way? What, what's, what's the attitude here? No, I think that's clear to me what was the attitude that one has to take generally about this. So the attitude is that you want to make these infrared divergences to be finite when you take eta going to zero because that means that the, if they are not finite, that means that this moon will keep growing even, even as today. So they will always appear at long distances in the in position space? Yes. Yes, yeah, so you that's why you, you don't you won't expect to that the sitter space have those kind of, of singularities. Yeah, but for the physical application of inflation, that's not clear because you never take eta to zero anyway. No, what you do it have to repeat the, the theory because of this i get that's what i was trying to mention about the chief symmetry because there are no divergences for inflation for inflationary correlation function i uh, guess i know that there's some divergences that will appear uh, when you include probably gravitons or other particles that might need to take care of mm -hmm. Okay, so are there more questions or comments? No? Okay, so if not, uh, I would like to thank Sebastian again for this talk and uh, remind you that uh, a, a copy of the video will appear in the YouTube channel of the HD. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I will stop the recording now.